I'm Mark Bayshore. I'm head of creative at Digital Kitchen. I'm flanked here by Dave Rosencrantz, who's a uh, partner uh, to the clients and also my partner in leading experience design at Digital Kitchen, our sort of environmental design di division, if you will. We don't really have a division, so actually we're the whole division, so yeah. for the most part. Uh, and to my left is Tim Schmuckel, CEO of Digital Kitchen. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. How's this? A little better? Sorry. Let me, let me just jump in sure. really quickly. We, we wanted to talk about this word environmental and the word experience. If anybody's here thinking we're talking about wireframes or <laughs> classic UX or something from an agency standpoint, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about um, the intersection of, uh, of digital and multimedia in physical spaces, architecture, um, spatial solutions. Um, so that's what this is about. Those of you who are here for UX can go to happy hour. <laughs> yeah, this will be a little interesting tour. It's a little bit of a uh, new tour for us, too. I'll give you a little background. If you, if you don't know much about Digital Kitchen, I'll give you a little bit of a very, very quick run through of our 15 years in business. It'll be very fast, though. We began about 15 years ago, actually here in Seattle in the kitchen of a little agency in Bellevue, hence the name Digital Kitchen, experimenting with motion graphics. This is back when this amazing program called Adobe After Effects just came out and you could make things move with a computer. And uh, that's what Digital Kitchen did. It was about two guys. And quickly we made a bit of a name for ourselves in motion graphics des and design. Uh, and somehow, I can't exactly explain why, we got a gig for a main title sequence called Six Feet Under, at the time, an unknown show. And, and we, uh, <laughs> some older folks in the audience. <laughs> uh, we uh, won the job and um, had no business winning the job. And we sh uh, designed it and shot it and made it. And the show was phenomenal and a groundbreaking show and kind of put us on the map because at the time, main title sequences were kind of nothing, they were kind of unheard of, much less well-designed storytelling, uh, thematic and metaphoric main title sequences. And so the phone started ringing doing that. And that, that, those main title sequences, although they practically put us out of business because it's not a very good business, business to be in to make money, put us on the map in a big way in terms of a firm that knew how to tell a story visually and quickly and efficiently. And that really took us into our sort of next uh, chapter of production. Film production, storytelling, and then we really started branding, almost like a little agency, branding campaigns, inventing and shooting, making whole campaigns, BMW, New Balance, and a slew of many, many others. Some animated, some live action, always with some sort of sense of, like that Six Feet Under title sequence, story, uh, metaphor, meaning, uh, something that's enduring, lasting, etc. Uh, that's always been the legacy sort of our, of our creative work, at least that's how I feel about it. Um, we went on to do a slew of other main titles, uh, Dexter and House and uh, True Blood most recently. But we've really kind of moved out of that business. Matter of fact, we don't do those main titles anymore. We've moved into like I say, branding, storytelling, and now interactive storytelling, a lot of sort of so-called cinematic storytelling uh, in the interactive space. And then most recently, what we're here to talk about today is digital storytelling in an environment, in a place, um, in, in particular a public place. Uh, that's, uh, that's where we are today. That's what is an area of an, our, probably our most intense interest, I'd say. And that's where we're, we've got a lot to say about the matter because we've, we've done a lot of these other things around the realms of entertainment, entertainment, branding, so on and so forth. But now that we're talking about digital or screens or monitors in a space, we have something to say about it. And that's what we'd like to share with you today. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, just a few, uh, I thought that was loud. Just a few things. So what we're gonna do is we thought that having a discussion would be a good way to talk about this topic so in that spirit, feel free to ask questions if they come up, and as if there's anything you want to add to, so we can make this interactive. Uh, the one thing we want to do is actually go through 
some of the fundamentals underlying our approach to uh, environments in depth. So we're not going to cover a lot of things broadly, but what we're going to cover, we're going to cover in depth, and they're going to focus on some of the fundamentals. The other thing, the question is, well, why are we talking about physical spaces at an interactive conference? And one of the things that, to answer that question, is that if you've seen around, screens and interactivity are popping up all around us. So already there's been a big push to include these as part of our, not just our physical world, or our virtual worlds, but our physical worlds. And so this is happening. We also think that if there's, there's an opportunity for the alt, artful integration of the physical and digital worlds to create experiences that didn't exist previously, and we believe when done well, they can actually drive uh, commerce, culture, and community. And those are the things that people are really looking for, whether in the whether if you are uh, in the world of commerce or even in the world of culture, whether it's museums or physical spaces, you're looking how to connect and engage with people. And that's why we think that often overlooked is the physical world and what actually can happen in, in these spaces. So we actually think so, sometimes there's a false dichotomy between the virtual world and the physical world as if one's a replacement for the other. We actually think if you bring harmony to those, you can enhance things uh, for the human experience in a way that hasn't been done before. So hopefully we can start talking about how, how, what the opportunities are in some of our approaches and approaches we've seen others who've thought about this smartly. Um, one of the things that we've, we've thought a lot about, you know, as this category is starting to emerge, um, where you're really getting the, um, the intersection of digital and multimedia with architectural spaces and environments, um, one of the things that we're seeing, quite frankly, is that we don't think it's being done very well. It's not being done very thoughtfully. Um, and more often than not, that's because it doesn't stem, the result doesn't stem from an integrated approach. And what we're really excited for and what we're looking forward to in the future is more um, architects, architects and designers and developers who actually want to bring these different disciplines together at the very initial stage of a project um, so that you can fully integrate uh, multimedia into a physical space in a way that's comfortable and natural for the people who are going to be in that space. What we typically see today is, is digital added as an afterthought, which usually means slapping some screens up on walls after a building's built and then trying to figure out some content to stuff into them. And we just, you know, our basic point of view is that that's fundamentally the wrong way to go about things. Um, and, you know, I think, Tim, you've got a great analogy about how new technologies have, have come along over the years and how they've been misused. Right. And, and if you just go back to the era of first television shows, and a lot of the first shows with this new medium took popular radio shows and set them to video. And that's a, that's a common thing to do is you, when you have a different medium, you take what you learned from the previous medium and you apply it to the new medium, even if it doesn't fit. And if anyone was, probably no one's old enough here to remember the first horseless carriages, which of course were automobiles. And if you look what happened even with radio, a lot of early radio shows were just taking the vaudeville format and applying them to, uh, in, in the radio, uh, for, for that new uh, broadcast media in the radio. And both of those have one commonality. They were both mass media, uh, mass media channels, and they were both one way. Well, if you take and look at screens and think of them as saying this is just a movie screen or a television screen or a cell phone screen, I think you're missing the point. This is now um, a screen that behaves and functions differently. And more importantly, the audience now in the digital era has been uh, taught to actually realize they have empowerment and choice. So if there's something that in the virtual world that I don't want, that I'm, I'm not interested in, I will not opt into it. And a lot of what technology has done in the digital world is allow you to opt in to an experience. Well, in the physical world, there's even more, that applies even more uh, with more, um, with more force, because unlike in the digital world, the physical world, if you enter a space, you don't have the ability through technology to opt out of any of the screens that are part of that experience. Your choices are either to endure it or leave. And because now uh, brands and uh, are becoming more about publishing content for their audience and trying to connect on, uh, for long-term engagement with their audiences, they have to think carefully about every interaction they have. So what we want to do is think about what is a new syntax or language or possibility with these screens that are now part of physical environments. Cool, yeah, so that's the heart of the matter. Is there any way screens can find a life uh, you know, beyond their previous life of television, the internet, and 
broadband and broadcast uh, in, in spaces. So to do that, before we look into the future, we also want to look way into the past and take a look at some of Tim's handprints that he's been doing recently. I'm just kidding. These are very old images about 30,000 years old. So there's nothing like talking about game changing in the 21st century by going back 30,000 years to a French cave. But I think there's some important principles that we can learn here. And if many of you have seen uh, the Cave of Forgotten Dreams, this is, these are 30,000 year old images that were part of a, a cave that was recently was discovered in the last 20 to 30 years. And, and part of what, why we, we're looking at these is really the power of images that are part of a physical environment to transcend space and convey powerful meaning even uh, 30,000 years later when we're not sure exactly what the purposes of these illustrations were, but we know that the people who made them um, used them over generations in time, or generations of time. And, and the other part that's really um, interesting is if you look at the caves, the, the walls themselves, the contours of the walls were used to create 3D effects and the, and the illusion of movement and even narratives. So here you have someone who actually figured out artistically how could they find integrate their art natively into the actual fabric of the structure, in this case, which was the rock. And so if you look and think about this, uh, one of the powers that comes from the caves is the fact that the images feel like they're almost born inside the crevices and nooks and crannies of the caves themselves, uh, the cave itself. And one thing I don't think this was intended is this cave may have had high levels of carbon dioxide that may have caused some hallucinogenic effects by the cave, the people who were in the cave. I don't know if that was part of the experience or not. I assume, I assume not. But we'll come back to why, you know, we'll come back to this, but just remember now this idea that these are uh, uh, images powerful for the human experience that are native to the environment. And the next one, we're gonna jump ahead 25,000 years and across the Atlantic to the United States to Horseshoe Canyon in Utah. And I, has anyone here been to Horseshoe Canyon and seen any of these pictographs? We've got one person. But the interesting thing here now is talking about the combination of, of images with sound. And there was a sonic um, archeologist who discovered that these pictographs in Utah actually occurred where the most prominent echo effects occurred. And they really, all five of these locations occur where, the, where really the, the highest echo effect occurred. And so the speculation or the belief is that these were designed actually to take advantage of naturally occurring, the naturally occurring echo effect, almost like our, you know, our great cathedrals and orchestra halls create. So now you see here human beings conveying some, again, some cryptic, mystic images where they're designed into the physical environment that this case actually had a combination of sight and sound. So now we see now another example of our early ancestors combining sight and sound to create, again, some kind of powerful um, effect that was important for, for their tribe. Um, the, now we're gonna jump again, one more, to uh, an ancient Mayan um, city of uh, uh, Chichen Itza, Itza, which is about 11, 11 <coughs> 1,100 years ago, and if you see here, and you watch, if you see the shadow descend down the staircase, it really represents a serpent a god that was descending <clears throat> down the cave, and if you see, there's a serpent head at the base of the steps, and here we have a combination of sight, sound, and motion. Um, you see the motion, the sound, if anyone, has anyone been to this temple? Yeah, if you've seen it, have you done the clapping with, so if you clap, it actually sounds like the uh, revered bird uh, of the Quetzal, the revered bird. So it actually has an, uh, if you clap, the echo effect creates a chirp of the bird. So you have another you know, example, again, of human beings using slight sound and motion to create a powerful experience. Um, in this case, the other advancement is that, it, unlike the two previous ones, these are, this is an example of a structure that was entirely man-made, and it was made also to uh, really, it reflects the Mayan's understanding of calendars, because there's 365 uh, steps here, which obviously represent the days in the year, and this effect of the shadow occurs only two times during the, during, uh, during the year, which are the spring and autumn equinoxes. So they actually had the knowledge to actually create this effect. So really what we wanted to do then with, um, with this is to jump forward now to say, after this exploration of, our, of early ancestors, what, how, have, uh, how has America in the 21st century used 
our technology um, and culture to build experiences. And so we will see, I guess, what, what we've done with, uh, with our advancements. This next piece has audio. I don't know if you have audio back here for my laptop or not. There we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we've come a long way since uh, serpents and scratching on walls. Culturally, overall, we've evolved quite a bit. This is my time to shine, and hopefully I shine for you guys. So, you know, what we, just, what we just really looked at was sort of, um, just as Tim talked about the language of radio, the language of television, that was a short edit sort of demonstrating the language of the screen, the language of the monitor, maybe the language of broadcast or broadband. It's very explicit. It's not confusing about what any of us are looking at. Sometimes it's beautiful, sometimes it's trashy, but it's not an implied art. It's not, it's not something, you know, we all become spectators. We all become sort of the same person or sort of homogenized when we all look at entertainment. We're living in an image-based society run and, you know, essentially dominated by the, the concept of enter being entertained or being entertaining. And I think that's really oftentimes what even fuels the internet and Instagram and uh, Pinterest is that you're essentially sort of your own entertain, entertainer to your own audience in many ways. And of course that just permeates throughout our culture. And, and again, this is sort of the, the language of the monitor and the language of our times visually. Really pleasing to the eyes. This is an image from one of my favorite movies called Battleship, which I was asked to watch on Delta Airlines from Minneapolis. 
to Seattle two well, weeks you ago. You weren't asked to watch. <laughs> you were forced to watch. Yes, it was an older plane with the monitors that come down, and every four feet, this movie played. I could not take my eyes off it. <laughs> it was impossible. I had other better things to do, but I watched two hours of Battleship. And that's sort of the point. It's just so compelling to the eyes, and at times even beautiful, but it essentially puts the imagination slowly to sleep in many ways in terms of our individually, individual ability to experience things differently when we're in the realm of entertainment. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, go so, ahead. So in, in part, we're taking the piss showing this, <laughs> but on the other hand, we're really serious because you know, when, when, when I said earlier about the idea that people just scrap, uh, slap screens up on walls you know, in a new building, in a mall, in an airport, what have you, and more often than not, this is the kind of content that you just have flashing at you the entire time. So this is the enemy, as far as we're concerned. This is what not to do um, when you're doing environmental design. Because again, there's no choice involved. It's just jammed down your throat. You walk into the hotel room, you check in, they've already got the television on for you. And this is usually the kind of content that's running at you. I hate that. <laughs> But one thing just to point out too is that this is, you know, goes beyond aesthetic sensibilities. If you go back to the example of Apple when it decided to launch its retail stores, most people said that's a crazy decision. You're going to first destroy your distribution network, and second, you have no experience at all running stores. Well, if you fast forward to today, Apple has the highest um, retail sales per square foot of any store in the United States. And so by creating an experience that actually not only people want to be part of, but actually drives commerce was a smart decision. And just so you know, Apple's about twice, has twice the retail scales per, per square foot than Tiffany's. And Tiffany sells, if you've ever been there, little diamonds that aren't very big at high margins. So the, the idea is that by getting this right, there's a lot of value whether you're, um, whether you're in municipality whether you're uh, in, in, uh, or if you have a, a, a business and you're trying to reach consumers and drive sales, this is a smarter way to approach it. And there's tremendous opportunities if done, uh, done well. So you've heard me say what I don't like. Um, we're going to come back to architecture again, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do like. Um, and we're going to start applying this to how you, um, how you integrate digital into this. Um, so um, we're going to show just a quick little video. Um, this is the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. Uh, architect was Louis Kahn. Um, very, very famous building. Um, as you can see from this overhead photo, it's sited right on the cliffs above the ocean. Um, and it has this dramatic courtyard that's set between two towers, which contain scientific laboratories, um, with this breathtaking view of the ocean. And um, it's certainly one of the, one of the uh, most wonderful pieces of architecture in the United States. And for me personally, it's my absolute favorite. Um, how many people have been to the Salk, just out of curiosity? A handful, great. The rest of you who didn't raise your hand, I hope you get the opportunity. Um, when, when you look at this grid of photographs, um, I'm gonna make an argument here that that is a screen. That's the equivalent of a screen when you're looking down that courtyard. And if you go at any time of day, um, year round, you will always see a different image. Um, and it is the most amazing integration of architecture with natural environment. And um, so what I, what I said before was wrong. I think this is what could be really right. So now, how do you go about integrating digital and multimedia into an architectural space to, to, to uh, embody this kind of an effect rather than the spectacle that we saw before? So we gave it a shot on this project. This is a project we've been working on for about three years, kind of an ongoing project uh, for the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas. This is a shot of the lobby. Um, Cosmopolitan is sort of a different hotel for Las Vegas, and a town known incidentally for nothing but spectacle. And they've put this sort of sophisticated hotel down uh, in hopes of drawing an entirely different crowd. They wanted to build their hotel in a way that didn't feel like anything else in Las Vegas and that maybe could exist happily in San Francisco or Barcelona or anywhere in the world, that it was that kind of place, um, which would feel very, very different for that city. The, the hotel is 
literally sort of wired and um, screened up like nothing you've ever seen. I think something like 500 screens throughout the, throughout the hotel. And the sort of masterpiece or centerpiece of it all is this lobby. Eight huge columns with uh, screens on all four sides uh, that dominate the, the lobby. That they're the columns that hold up the whole building. It's a 52-story tower. Um, and they came to Digital Kitchen to do uh, the entirety of the programming for the digital experience throughout the hotel. But we just wanted to show a couple of images of, uh, of, one, of one of the themes in particular that we, that we tackled. Um, it's kind of interesting. This is like, this is the ultimate assignment. I mean, it's like the palette and the, the potential of these monitors to either just ruin your whole day, kind of like a why did they do that to me experience is totally there, or uh, I can't believe they did that for me experience, which I think we pulled off. That's why we wanted to show you, show you this. Um, it really, it really sort of, I guess, demonstrates that you can be arresting without creating spectacle. I think those, those are two different things. I'll just show you a little piece of one of the columns in motion. Um, again, these, were, these all had different stories going on, different faces. Um, let's see here. And this one had a lot of negative space. Oh, here it is. Yeah. And I guess this is what, a, a really good example of maybe what Dave was talking about taking some inspiration from architecture or maybe even sculpture more than inspiration from the world of film. Uh, and, and I don't mean that just because this isn't moving very much. Um, it, it is sculptural in that sense. But also it doesn't uh, edit. Um, the transitions, when there are transitions, are really, really concealed. You barely even find them. You won't find a sequential story with cuts like you do in even theater movie making, television, so on and so forth. It just sort of is. You can come into the lobby at any time, you can leave at any time. You can probably hear me talking to you while we watch this, which is unlike the other sequence we saw. And what I think is kind of interesting about some of these images is if you use your imagination, they look not that much unlike those Horseshoe Canyon figures in Utah. And they don't behave that much differently. Matter of fact, I could probably make a case pound for pound, these are less spectacular than those were for their time, given that this is in Las Vegas, Nevada, in a big hotel lobby. Um, you guys want to say any more about this? <laughs> okay. Um, so, so this is, uh, it even has, let me forward real quick, because I'm super proud. My main contribution to this project was a wolf. And you gotta have a wolf, there, there it was. And I just wanted to show you a wolf because that really helps bring the extra dimension of fairy tale to the whole whole project. And I, again, like I think there's enough uh, ambiguity in these images where you can again have, not only have a conversation, but if you are engaged, so-called engaged in it, you can ask yourself, what are these people doing? What do they want? Why is there a wolf there? I think I think I know what they want, but. <laughs> And so th I guess this is sort, sort of the, the heart of the matter or our philosophy or our, our game-changing idea to contribute to this conference is that, you know, when it comes to public spaces, isn't there a responsibility not to just mirror a society drowning in entertainment and distraction and spectacle and not to pick up where TV left off or where the Internet left off in terms of the moving image on a screen maybe gain its inspiration from the purpose and the place of the building itself. So we're going to go back to the sulk now. Um, if you're starting to get motion sickness, we will have Dramamine <laughs> on the way out. We're bouncing around here a little bit, but hang with us. Um, it makes sense to us, at least. Um, the, a little bit on my background. Um, before working with Digital Kitchen, I was involved in the museum industry, and I also um, spent a number of years working with Dale Chihuly, um, organizing some of his large installations around the world. And, um, well, Chihuly, now there's a good example of someone, you know, very divisive character, actually. Some people love his work, and some would lump it right in with the spectacle and say that that's the enemy. 
um, the Salk Institute, when they had their 50th anniversary two years ago, um, the, uh, the, head of the, the, the president of the board of directors at the Salk was a uh, patron of, of Dale Chihuly's and um, suggested the idea of doing an, an art installation on the campus um, at the Salk. Um, this was a very provocative idea, actually. Um, the, uh, the Salk was originally, Jonas Salk's original concept for this facility and this institution was that it was going to embody both art and science. And given the timing of this around the discovery of the polio vaccine, um, it ended up being that uh, uh, it really turned out to be a scientific f facility and then the money ran out and they never really got around to the art. Um, so there is a, there's an interest there in art and there was, there was a lot of controversy actually amongst Controversy is maybe not the right word, but um, there was a lot of discussion amongst the, the scientific community who works there on the campus about this idea of putting artwork on what they consider to be sacred ground. And so where does responsibility come into this? Um, we at the we at Chihuly Studio had to figure out a way to make this work. And what that really means is understanding the environment understanding the people who are going to use it and trying to figure out what would actually enhance their environment rather than just sticking something down there as, as, a, as an ego trip, I guess. Um, so we spent a number of months traveling back and forth, um, getting to know the scientists. There's a number of Nobel laureates there and, and uh, it was quite interesting actually once you started looking at uh, some of the um, similarities in color and shape and form and pattern um, between some of Dale's work and some of the individual pieces of glass um, along with the uh, um, along with some of the imagery that the scientists generate underneath microscopes etc in the process of their discovery and we actually ended up having some really interesting conversations um, regarding the process that, that was happening in the laboratories and how the experimentation actually mirrored a lot of what goes on in an art studio. So over the course of a number of months, we actually created an, 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 an emotional environment between the Chihuly Studio and the Salk Institute and the scientists and the administrators there, um, where there became an investment in, in a collaboration. Um, long story short, we ended up doing an exhibition there which lasted only 10 days. Um, and every day we changed the artwork on a daily basis. So we'd be out there at five in the morning as the sun was coming up or, or you know, nearly at midnight changing artwork. And what we found was that the scientists would actually come out and they wanted to talk to us about the process of what was going on and, and compare and make analogies to what they do in the laboratory. And at the end of this um, week and a half, uh, the kind of the highest compliment that was, that was shelled out for this experiment that we did was that there were scientists who work in the North Tower and scientists who work in the South Tower, some of who have been there for decades, who had not talked for weeks or months or years until they came out into this courtyard environment. Um, and so it was really, it was really greatly successful. Um, is this digital? No, that's not the point. The point is, it's about the approach, the intent, the responsibility to enhance a public space and do it on behalf of the people who are actually going to use it. And so it's that type of point of view, again, that we're trying to bring a digital kitchen. And we would encourage anybody who's working in the environmental, multimedia, and digital design field to come at it from that angle. Um, it's not a website. It's not a movie. It's not a TV screen. So we wanted to show you one more project that we're just getting ready to tackle um, to give you a little insight on you know, why we're grappling with this, why, why we're talking about this and why we grapple it because it's right in our lap right now with real projects, good projects that are kind of epic and this is one of them. Um, this is the uh, new terminal, these are construction photos uh, at LAX, the International Terminal called Bradley. Do you want to give a little background on yeah. this as well, I scroll through? Um, LAX is in the process of um, basically redoing their entire uh, airport terminal by terminal. Um, 
collectively, it's the largest public works project in the history of Los Angeles. Um, the, the pinnacle of this is going to be the international ter terminal, Bradley West International Terminal. Um, they're clearly intending to build a world-class facility. They brought in Fentress Architects, who've designed a beautiful building that's, you know, clearly on par with uh, Terminal 5 at Heathrow or some of the new... Um, some of the new and or remodeled terminals at Changi Airport in Singapore. Um, so they built this amazing building, and then some other people came along and said, hey, what this building could use is a ginormous environmental multimedia display system. Um, so this concept, and you'll, we'll, we'll play this fly through, you'll see a number of giant screens throughout this. There's about six or seven different major multimedia features. Um, so these were added after the fact um, without respect, well, I shouldn't say respect, but without the direct participation, I guess, of, of the architect, without the planning of the architect. And that leaves a potential problem, which is, well, what do you put on these screens? Um, what are you going to do? So Digital Kitchen is one of the companies who's been invited in to, uh, to solve this question. Um, the terminal will open next, um, next April, and we'll all see how it goes. And hopefully, we'll be able to show you some of the finished work next year. Um, but um, it, it, it's an example of a pro problem that we're tackling and trying to bring the same approach to it, that this can't be, you know, it's not old Hollywood footage. It's not Google logos. It's not <laughs> Coca-Cola. It's like what? What could you, you know, what could you possibly do? Do you, do you want to advance to the? Yeah. Time so tower? these are. Yeah. Uh, this is an online video that was done maybe a year before the assignment came to us, and that that uh, there's that huge what's called the storyboard on our left, covered in blue, and then uh, bigger yet, sort of the centerpiece of the whole thing is called the time tower. And I mean, it is huge. It it makes that. Cosmopolitan project look like a, you know, iPhone almost or something like that. It's this thing is that that man is to scale. It's six stories high, uh, covered on all four sides with um, video capability, and uh, it's the biggest thing I've ever seen. It's the the building's the biggest building I've ever been in, and that thing is the biggest screen I've ever seen, maybe outside of the the big one at the Dallas football stadium or something like that. But I think this one might be bigger than that. And it's certainly bigger in terms of having four dimensions. So it's, it's an, an, incredible, um, an incredible palette to work with. And, and uh, we're kind of uh, overwhelmed at the, at the power of this thing and its scale. And, uh, everybody that's on the project, you sort of looked at this blank space and said, "Well, where do you even, where do you even begin? Like, what do you, do you, how do you even start designing uh, motion content for something like this?" And so we went back um, to basically the same process that Dave was talking about, about getting to the heart of the matter. It, it's probably worth noting one of the main assignments from the client was to really, uh, with all of these, all six of these media feeds features bring home the so-called brand of Los Angeles. What is, what is Los Angeles about? about? And of course, we said, well, what's the, what does that mean to you? And the client was like, well, we don't know. We're an airport. And those guys are the architects. You're the agency. So we were like, OK. So that was our first assignment was, what is Los Angeles? Even people in Los Angeles don't know what Los Angeles is about. It's spread out. and. It's all, uh, is it about the beaches? Is it about shopping? Is it about uh, Hollywood and the film business? Nobody really knows. And so that was really our first assignment. Long, long before we designed anything, we went about trying to articulate what the heart and beauty of the city of Los Angeles is so that when people from all over the world come in, they see a bit of that. And that just as importantly, for the people that live in Los Angeles coming in and out, something that they would be proud of and say, that's why I live here. That's why I love Los Angeles. That's a huge task and a very deceptive. That, that was probably the hardest part of this whole job, is trying to put your finger down on what makes the city of Los Angeles beautiful. Do you want to show the 
the tone edit. Yeah. So what 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 that leads to, we're we're going to show you a little bit of what our process looks like, um, in in conceptualizing just what Mark was just describing. Um, Given the given the history of filmmaking within Digital Kitchen, that's one of the first places we kind of go to 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 solve questions. So oftentimes at the beginning of a project, um, we need to set a north star for ourselves. Like what what are we trying to communicate in a project? And in this case, it was you know what what is LA and what do we love about Los Angeles? So we made a short film, and this isn't something that's a client deliverable. This is something for us internally. Um, that we not only use to sort of kick off our work, but also to come back to through the entire process of creating the work to make sure that we haven't gone astray. Uh, yeah, almost like a little main title for a brand, or in this case, a city. All made from scrap. We didn't shoot any of it. We just find it. And uh, this, is, this is what I cut uh, for LA. Again, we do this all the time. I think the levels are a little low on this movie, so you might want to turn it up back there. Here it is. This is the first thing we showed the client. Uh, when we went and presented uh, our work. So that was, uh, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that little, that, sorry. I was just going to say our real point, I think, in showing that is to, to ask you how do you feel after seeing that and how does that feeling differ from the spectacle clip that we showed, which was actually the same length. Um, there's, you know, a, a, a gulf of difference there. and. That's, that's the kind of work that we're striving for, and that's what we would hope um, would inform these kind of environmental projects, whether it's DK or any other company doing it. Yeah, and that, that, that last little sign that was on a, some shop in Los Angeles covered in tarps that said it's a freedom thing, that, that really became, for me, what it's all about. That it's not, it, the answer isn't anywhere in LA or anything in LA, it's little tiny microcultures that you love and um, live in. And um, that sense of freedom that the wave represents, which incidentally was the sort of inspiration for the building itself, um, when Fentress took, took the project, um, and that you can be anything you want when you move to Los Angeles, the only city on the globe that you were truly free of judgment, uh, more, or more free than any other place on the planet where you can reinvent yourself, you can move from Milwaukee, you can be whoever you want to be in LA. And that's what's beautiful about it. And, that's, that, that was the heart of what we would like, what, where we kicked off our designers. We sort of went with that mantra and we said, design with that in mind. And there's your 
giant time tower to do it with. That's how we tackled it. But you don't have to spend a billion dollars or more in the case of that airport to be transformational. Um, so we want to talk for a few minutes about Stanley, our interactive piano player. Um, do you want to describe Stanley as best you can? You guys probably know it. It's playing downstairs and it's been around um, at the Capitol Hill block par party. It's, uh, you know, an, sort of a, it was an inspiration waiting for a home. I think I'll probably just play the, our little case study yeah. on it that does a pretty good job of explaining. I think this is sort of the, a good example of the next step. We talked about the imagination as a, par as a participant, uh, your, your, your heart as a participant. And now this is literally you driving the thing and running the thing, uh, and that's that interactive component that we love. Here's the case study. I'll stop talking. It's interesting when you work in a creative environment. Ideas are always what drives everything. I knew that Stanley was possible, but I didn't know exactly how. It pretty much came out of one main idea from one of our creatives. And it evolved into something that seemed really tangible and something that we knew we could make. Well, when an inanimate object has a sense of the world and understands more than it possibly should, you build this weird connection between the person and the piano. We were all amazed with the press and hype that Stanley got. Really reputable news sources like ABC, Huffington Post, Vimeo, FWA, Wired, Creative, a huge amount. People were really excited to make requests to Stanley via Twitter. Immediately we saw phones coming out, they wanted to hear their songs. A person would tweet at Stanley Piano, a moderation tool would look through the tweets, find artist names and or song titles. The MIDI file playing was automated, but the personality of the piano was from somebody behind the scenes. The reason why we didn't automate everything Stanley did was because we wanted to have that live element. We wanted to be able to call out people who were standing in front of Stanley. So we had a lot of people sing along and dance, and it was a much more personalized experience. We streamed the whole event as well. That meant that people could make requests from anywhere. So if you were in France or Sweden, you still had the opportunity to uh, play with the piano. So sometimes ideas come from out of nowhere and they seem too good to be true and you just have to go make them. And that, for the most part, wraps us up. It's, I'm a, Tim, let you try and explain what we were sure. thinking to glue caves, canyons, temples, science labs, America's Got Talent, airports, and interactive player pianos together. <laughs> oh boy, that's, so the purpose I think we talked about is that there's a, um, consumers and audiences feel empowered with the digital era. And in the, in the physical world, there's an opportunity to actually make um, a power, a combine a digital, a virtual and, and physical worlds together to create powerful experiences that build community and they can drive impressive results for whatever uh, whatever venue you're trying to do I mentioned the example of Apple store the example with cosmopolitan was you know with this the um, experience with the videos in the, in the lobby helped propel cosmopolitan to be the hottest hotel in, in Las Vegas with highest room rates highest occupancy rates not just because of our work but because there became an identity that came to life in tangible and visceral ways. And if you can connect with people powerfully um, on an emotional level, you can, um, you know, you can achieve whatever results you're trying to, whether you're a museum, a civic space, or a brand. And I think right now the audiences are looking for real genuine um, engagement where they feel empowered, where their imagination can help, can co-create with, with the experience. 
And what, oh. And so one of these things, why we started with the caves, is that if you base what you do on some fundamental human truths, you can have powerful engagement that derives, uh, drives results and, uh, for, your, for, um, for whatever you're trying to achieve. I think we're about an hour in, so we'd love to leave any room for questions or comments, but that kind of wraps it up for us, and we're back to the horse. Yeah, we talk about that all the time. One of, usually the typical first request is to do things that are sort of flavor of the month. That was the request that, um, or flavor of the year at LAX. Could, could people maybe walk by and the screens would react if they wave their arms? And things that, we've, that we're seeing right now, but how tired are those going to look next year? Honestly, we just, I don't, I don't have a very smart answer other than say we don't want to do that. We, we opt for imagery, and I think we have a little bit of a reputation for creating imagery or stories that do last and look good with time. They're not necessarily the hippest thing in the world or the flavor of the month visually or even technically, but they have a little bit more meaning and staying power. you have anything you want Yeah, to I, I, um, it's, it's a great question that, that doesn't have an answer apart from the fact that you can't really solve that problem. Um, you know, thing, things are going to change, whether you're talking about the digital components of it or, or you know, how the, how the plumbing works. It's like all aspects of buildings and everything becomes, you know, dated at some point. Um, I guess what we're arguing is that by approaching it the way that we do, um, you're more likely to have, to come up with a solution that's going to have a longer shelf life. Um, than if you do something that's much more immediate and short-sighted, um, which is usually what the client asks you for when they first make the phone call. Did you have a question in front? Um, we're talking so much about the health of online communities and how to bring social networks together and people together online, and it's always all about the digital, and we've forgotten about our the health of our real communities. And I hear you guys say community, but I feel like you're almost talking about the brand community when you talk about community for these spaces. But what about actual communities and bringing real people together, breaking down social spaces in cities, for instance, and especially talking about the big waterfront project that's happening in Seattle right now and how to make those real communities healthier by creating kind of a self-monitoring system where people meet that wouldn't normally meet and talk to each other. If you have anything to add to that kind of conversation or projects that touch on that at all. Well, certainly, um when we're talking about community, we are very much talking about the people who will inhabit the space. Um, and, you know, in the case of a project like LAX, um, there are a number of different communities there that, that intersect. There's not only the people of Los Angeles who will travel in and out of that airport, there's the people from around the world who will travel in and out of that airport, and then there's the literally like 14,000 people who work there and go there every day. So. Um, so that was one of the things that we're trying to address is trying to understand what all those people need and, and how, do you, um, how do you cycle the content through a day part and a week and a month in a way that is, um, that's fresh and compelling um, and that will speak to, to everyone. Um, in addition to that, our, our hope is to incorporate social media components with that so that people can actually interact. Um, and again, I can't, you know, I can't say too much about the project since we're still designing it and it hasn't been built yet. But um, certainly the goal is to transform the space in a way that, that um, community is not defined by the four walls of the space because the world isn't, doesn't work that way anymore. Informa you, know, you, can, you can send a message to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Um, and that's what we want people to do when they're at the airport. We, we're, we're, we're hoping that, you know, that we will bring back a little bit of the sense of mystery and romance and enjoyment to travel that's literally been squished out of it in the last few decades. Um, so it, it is very much about about people and trying to create community. So whether that's in an airport or down on our waterfront, um, again, it goes back to the point that I made earlier, I think, um, of 
uh, of finding the developers, the people who are really initiating these projects, um, and getting them to understand what's possible, and bringing the right parties to the table um, from the start, rather than doing it in kind of a linear progression, the way that it's often done. Let me just add one thing to that. One thing we think about is that if you, th you look at the screens are a collective experience that everyone sees together. But what thing, one thing most people carry with them is a smartphone or other device where they can have more direct and uh, connected experiences. So when we think about these together, we think about what's the public experience that everyone takes part of and what are the other extensions off of that that can be more personal, direct, and actually reach out even among the subsets or groups of the people within, within that physical space that defined by their interest? And how do they actually pull into your own network of friends that aren't there with you so you can actually share experiences with them simultaneously where you're enjoying it? But we think about this as both the collective and the personal. And I think as a personal is where there's a lot, like Dave was mentioning, a lot of things that we're thinking about with the LAX context of how, how that can occur. And when you think about when you travel, you're in between, you're away from home, and you're in between here and there, and the family is really important for you. And how do you stay connected with them? And how might you, through serendipity, connect with people you know that happen to be traveling as well? And those are all, I think, part of the journey that we're trying to actually, why, why we think the virtual and, and physical worlds need to be actually designed together is where you can create these, these connections. And if we didn't answer your question directly, talk to us afterwards. Be happy okay. to carry on more. And I think we're getting the, are we getting the hook? <laughs> yeah, that, there's the hook. Okay, two words, happy hour. <laughs> hey, thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Thanks everyone, thank you.